Well, let's open with a word of prayer. Hmm? Well, Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in peace and without persecution. We recognize, Father, this is a unique privilege on this planet. We appreciate this opportunity. We pray, Father, that you would help us, that the lessons not be wasted. We pray, Father, that you just open our hearts and lives to your word and we and your word to our lives, Father, that in all these things we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we commit this evening and ourselves. Amen. Well, we are in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 14 tonight. And uh, just to, by way of a little warm-up or background, I think most of you realize we uh, Revelation has its own outline in the, at the end of chapter 1. It's divided into three parts. Write the things which thou hast seen, John is told, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The things which have passed by the time you get to this verse is a vision of the Lord, a post-resurrection physical description of our Lord Jesus Christ, up to about from verse 12 on. But when you get to verse 19, we then have this division. Write the things which are. That turns out to be the seven churches. This uh, package was... Uh, fronted with some letters, seven letters to seven representative churches. And uh, that's probably the most important part of the entire book, if you're just joining us. The, uh, the part of the book that you really want to master are those uh, two chapters. Because they're the ones that affect all of us. The rest is interesting, but really something we'll watch from the mezzanine. Because that from chapter four on uh, is post-rapture, we believe. But uh, anyway, this is the, the, the uh, division that... Um, uh, John was given, and we of course are in the third part of that division as we go forward here. We've noticed from the beginning what we call the heptatic structure, that we have, have a, we're confronted with a seven sealed scroll, and uh, uh, we also notice that there's always a parenthesis or a change of subject between the sixth and seventh element. And uh, when we get to the seventh uh, seal, when it was opened, we encountered seven trumpets. Trumpets of announcement, declaration, what have you. And again, between the 6th and 7th, there was a parenthesis of four cha uh, five chapters. Chapters 10 through 14. We are in the last of those chapters tonight. Because when we go from chapter 14, we'll then encounter the 7th the tr uh, trumpet, which will embrace, uh, lead to um, seven censers, bowls, um, vials in some of your translations. Uh, bowls in most of them. But it's a bowl in the sense of a censer, if you will, like a flat dish, really. But in any case, uh, uh, it also will have just a little one-verse parenthesis, but that's we're sensitive to the fact that the whole entire book is very, very structured. In fact, uh, you can't, I defy you to make an exhaustive list of the sevens in this book. There are probably hundreds. Um, but we are in the close of this parenthesis tonight. We had uh, four chapters so far in this parenthesis. Chapter 10 with the little book and the seven thunders. Chapter 11 dealt with the temple and also the mysterious two witnesses. Chapter 12 was a summary of Israel. The woman gives birth to the man-child and the red dragon that's there to try to mess things up. And that led to the two, the duet. We sometimes call him the Antichrist, forgetting there's actually two guys, the two beasts. But we were thus, in, the, in those chapters, introduced to seven persons. The woman, the man-child, the dragon, Michael, who's fighting, the remnant of Israel, and then these two beasts, one out of the sea and one out of the earth. That was in chapter 13, last time. And so, okay, so, uh, and this also lays out a conflict between two seeds. The seed of the woman, in Genesis 3.15, when God declares war on Satan, he mentions two seeds. The seed of the woman, which becomes a title of Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent that is uh, often overlooked, but that's Satan's person who's in the wings that uh, he's going to spring on the world when the time comes. Red Dragon, Satan, and the coming world leader and the false prophet being in the minds of some people at the satanic trinity, if you will. And these same forces are in the world today. who are operating. So, okay. So we, by, by, that's by way of perspective, we're going to jump into chapter 14 which is like a table of contents of what's coming later. It's like a prelude to the, the climax of the book, which are these um, seven bowls of God's wrath that will be poured out. 
Now we're going to see the Lamb on Mount Zion with his 144,000 commandos, I'll call them. But then we're going to encounter something most commentaries miss. There's actually, I believe, seven angels in chapter 14. And uh, the first one is with the eternal gospel. The second one is announcing the doom of Babylon. And we'll take up that one in, in detail in chapter 17 and 18. Then there's a third angel that announces the fury on the beast worshipers. There's a voice that, that announced, which I suspect is also an angel for reasons I'll show you, uh, speak, uh, that uh, t speaks to the righteous dead. Then there's t three other angels that call for the grape harvest. This is a different harvest than you may have in mind. We often think of the harvest of souls in the, in the mystery sense as, as evangelizing for the gospel. That's a harvest maybe, but this is a different kind of harvest. A very, very bloody, climactic uh, harvest that's forthcoming. So uh, that's the chapter that we have in front of us. Let's just jump in. First verse. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I want you to notice something interesting. How many are there? How many were sealed in chapter 7? We're getting to the end of the tribulation. How many have been lost? None. It's not 143,999 or whatever. None. And uh, that makes it parallel, in a sense, to Noah's Ark. How many animals were lost in Noah's Ark? None. Uh, and that's a mystery too. We can deal with when we we, we do deal with when we get into uh, uh, Genesis uh, Genesis seven and eight. But uh, 144,000. And Jesus makes that remark to his father in when, in the in the high priestly prayer in John 17. He says to the father, "All that you've given me, I have lost none." And uh, boy, there's a there's a testimony for all of our security, I believe. And uh, it's interesting that these 144,000 have come through the tribulation with none lost because they were sealed to prevent any losses. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 3, the three Jewish young men that were thrown into the fiery furnace? How many of them got hurt? None. That's kind of interesting because where was Daniel? Many people miss that, but Daniel is not even in the story. Daniel is, you know, physically probably sent on an errand by the king out of the country, which has caused his enemies to spring this trap on his three friends and, and so forth. But it's interesting, as a model, if the, if the fiery furnace is a type, if Nebuchadnezzar's image is a type or a foreshadowing of the uh, Antichrist's image, and then if the three Jewish young men are uh, uh, typed, if you will, as the uh, 144,000, it's uh, all that fits pretty well, except wh what does Daniel represent then? Those that are not present. Who is not present here in this at this point in the Book of Revelation? The Church. Good for you. Anyway, that's our view, and uh, there's many good scholars that would have different views, but that happens to be ours. And so, um, something else that's kind of interesting here: John is watching the 144,000 standing with whom? Jesus Christ. And where are, where, is, where are they standing? On Mount Zion. But I thought all this was going on in heaven. Interesting problem, isn't it? See, most of us tend to think that heaven is remote in a whole other dimension or something. And I'm sure it is in another dimension. At the same time, it's interesting, it might be really around us. Because we're in a simulation. We know that from physics considerations, that we're in a digital simulation. We're, de we're but a shadow of a larger reality, according to Scientific American. Well, if that's the case, it, there may be a relationship uh, of where they are physically uh, and literally the geography that we know as Mount Zion. Because we'll talk a little bit about Mount Zion. And, uh, but it's interesting, uh, these, these were preserved by, by the Lamb because they were sealed. Who is preserving us today? The person of Christ, not methods or programs, the person of Jesus Christ. So one of the questions I'll let you think about on your way home tonight, how long has it been since you told him that you love him? That you're grateful for that. None missing, and they're standing with him on Mount Zion. Those are our key points of that little verse. Let's just move on. Mount Zion itself, of course, was captured by David from the Jebusites, 2 Samuel 5. It's uh, predicted in Zechariah 12 to be a cup of trembling, 
a burdensome stone for all the world. And that's what we're experiencing today. That's exactly what's going on. And uh, even right now, it's focus of Satan's uh, uh, interest, and it's going to be uh, increasingly intense. It's interesting that Islam ignored it for over a thousand years until they discovered it was important to the Jews. Then it became the third most important <laughs> place in, 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 in the Islam, even though there's no mention of it in the Quran, etc. But interesting, in Psalm 2, we of course have this declaration that the it's a dialogue, a trialogue between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you read Psalm 2, figure out who's talking. What's interesting, it, it anticipates the world going to war against God. Many people miss that. You want to read Psalm 2 in that regard, but one of the things even there, the rebuttal by God Himself is, I have set my King upon my holy hill of Zion. There is a destiny on the planet Earth of Jesus Christ to rule the planet Earth from Mount Zion. And that's something that a very small percentage of churches uh, in this country are uh, sensitive to or aware of. And yet that's what the Bible clearly declares. All through the Psalms you'll find this emphasized. There are over 30 Psalms that deal with this. This is just a small representation. The deliverance of the uh, deliverance is committed of the 144,000 we believe in the uh, Psalm 20, the kings of, earth, uh, of the earth are gathered, and there's a woman in travail in Psalm 48, and it goes right on through. Uh, there's, uh, again and again and again, you'll find that the Psalms illuminate the destiny of Zion. Psalm 110 is very well known because of the allusions to Melchizedek, and the, the ruling with a rod of iron and so forth, and that, and that uh, the king that's in focus there is sitting at the right hand. And uh, so on it goes. Um, Israel will be united in Psalm 133. Babylon will be destroyed in Psalm 137, which is something we're going to see emphasized when we get to verse 8 of chapter 14. And, uh, and so forth. The vengeance of all, upon all nations in Psalm 149 and so forth. The Psalms are an incredible treasure chest of prophecies as well as devotion. But let's get to verse 2. <laughs> John says, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts. And be, or I should say the four living creatures is a better translation. And the elders. And, no, and, and by the way, notice there that the the uh, beasts and the elders are separate. They're not, uh, they're, they're distinctive. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. The new, it's a new song. Only the redeemed can sing these songs before the, and that's, that's emphasized in Psalm 3, Psalm 40, 96, 98, all the way through the psalm. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Well, now this this develops a lot of discussion. What does it mean by virgins? Is this literal? No reason it isn't. Jeremiah, you may recall, was forbidden to marry in Jeremiah 16. And uh, Jesus gave a warning relative to the tribulation. Pray that uh, your flight not be in winter and so forth, and that, uh, no, that you not give suck and so forth. Jesus' warning simply, seemingly at least, uh, recognizing that it was important for them in those days to be very mobile and unencumbered, if possible. But this is probably, the real emphasis here probably also is figurative. Idolatry is all through the scripture identified as spiritual fornication. Ezekiel 16 is one of your many references on that, but there's lots of them. And uh, the church is presented as the chaste virgin to Christ. Again, the issues here are spiritual, not having to do with, you know, uh, biological reproduction. In, in church, in contrast to Jezebel, which of course was a prostitute, a whore in effect. And uh, that's dealt with by Paul in Ephesians 5 on the positive side and 2 Corinthians 11 too on the other side. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, I believe, what's in view here. And in their mouth was found no guile. 
for they are without fault before the throne of God. I think that's the central thrust of the passage, is that uh, they were not taken in by the defilements of the world. And I think that goes far beyond the issue of women, so where it goes into the whole issue of their spiritual purity. And uh, they were not taken in by the lie that Paul talks about uh, that will characterize this period. Remember what Paul tells you in 2 Thessalonians 2, that the, that, uh, the non-believers will be taken in by a very specific lie that will be sprung by Satan's man. And uh, so they're without fault or without blemish is actually the term, uh, since they were clothed with the righteousness, of course, of the Lamb. So uh, these are, uh, they, they come off very well here. Down to verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of the heaven having the everlasting gospel uh, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. And uh, so today we have the gospel of grace that, of course, is pro proclaimed uh, from the pulpits if they're on, on there. But here they're going to be, it's going to be proclaimed by angels and uh, who are indestructible. See, even the two witnesses in, ch in uh, chapter 11 finally get killed. But these, are, these angels are indestructible. And, uh, and he's saying with a loud voice, fear God. It's a different gospel. More, uh, more, it's one of uh, a coming vengeance. And give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. That's what all this has been leading up to. And it's going to be hammered away in chapter 15, 16. We're going to see the wrath of God poured out. So this is sort of like a last call, a final call. Um, and... Uh, the, uh, this one is good news for God's people, but it really is bad news for the rebellions, the earth dwellers, that this is all going to start focusing on. It's the last chance, so to speak. Give, fear God. Give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. Notice something here. I missed this uh, for many, many years. Uh, the emphasis here is on God as a creator. Yes, it's on Jesus Christ. Never miss that. But it's interesting. The issue is, here is the creation. And it fascinates me to realize how important, how fundamental, how the first step in one's consciousness is to, to recognize and acknowledge God as the creator. And it's that failure that leads to all the other problems. Um, in Romans chapter 1, it really astonished me to, to really uh, come to grips with the fact that the, uh, the failure to recognize God as a creator will result in his judgment of giving them over to homosexuality. Speaking of a culture, what have you. And it's interesting how in, this, in, in, in America, the, the uh, widespread um, uh, uh, disbelief or denial, I should say, of God as a creator. The whole commitment in our schools and so forth to evolution lays the, the result of that is God gives them over to homosexuality. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 on lays it all out. And the emphasis is God as a creator. There are other gospels. There are false gospels that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11 and also Galatians 1, obviously. Gabriel had a gospel or good news announcing the birth of John. This is uh, the, the gospel in the sense of being good news is, is same thing. The, the, remember the angelic hosts that were that visited the shepherds. We always celebrated Christmas. Those shepherds, we believe, were in the fields. It originally belonged to Ruth and Boaz. The book of Ruth, of course, is what links Bethlehem to the house of David in the first place. But in any case, uh, the, sh the shepherds get the good news, if you will, from the angelic hosts. And Paul gets uh, the news of the spiritual growth of the Thessalonian church. Very up a very upbeat report at the very critical time. And the seventh angel, the mystery of God, will be finished. It's his declaration. Remember in, back in uh, Revelation chapter 10. So in the preaching of the kingdom in, in Matthew 24. These are all gospels. But uh, this is the creation orientation here fascinates me. It's in contrast to our culture. Science in our culture has become very anti-God. The original concept of science, the original commitment of science, was the pursuit of truth. But uh, it has been taken over by a leadership which insists upon naturalistic explanations. It denies any evidence to the contrary. And uh, uh, Paul warned us in Colossians 2, beware... Uh, 
that they don't uh, uh, that you don't get taken with uh, philosophy and vain deceit. And um, in contrast to what the spirit uh, uh, the scripture declares in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. And you go right through that psalm. You you can't go to the, even the night sky without being confronted with the majesty of God. And of course, Romans one. Uh, picks it up from there. I want you to notice the contrast that we have today, if you take up any of the scientific magazines, with respect to the scientists that made science. Kepler, back in the 16th century, end of the, and so forth, sometimes called the divine mathematician, or I should say, he regarded God as the, a divine mathematician whose mind could be discovered in the precise mechanics of the universe. As, as they began to discover the universe, they felt they were getting confronted with an intelligence that designed it. And that was what motivated them. That's what drove them. And uh, arguably, J Sir Isaac Newton uh, is probably one of the greatest science that ever scientists that ever lived. And he also regarded God as a divine presence uh, who set the universe in motion. He, you know, uh, Newton virtually invented calculus, mechanics, optics, um, incredible uh, contributions. Quote, his, his quote was that, uh, this most beautiful system of the sun, planet, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of the intelligent and powerful being. And uh, it's very interesting that um, it took, uh, Newton also believed in being very free to pursue his religious commitments. And uh, it was by a special uh, uh, provision of the king that he did not have to uh, be part of the Church of England, by the way. I think that's kind of interesting if you get into that background. But uh, Sir Isaac Newton wrote over a million words of commentary on Daniel and Revelation, and uh, a very, very he, he he took he took his Bible um, studies very, very literally, very seriously. Anyway, moving on, verse eight uh, of chapter four, and there followed another angel. We're now encountering the. Um, Destruction of Babylon. We're going to have two chapters on that when we get to 17 and 18. But here the angel is announcing, if you will, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we're going to get into a lot of that. Babylon has always been Satan's headquarters from the beginning. The worship, the worship of Semiramis, the female deity uh, that was associated with Nimrod and so forth, uh, was the fountain bed of all religions. You'll notice again and again, it's always Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Ever wonder about that? Why is it mentioned it twice? It's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, there is a passage. I think I've got a slide. Uh, in, in, uh, it's, mentioned, it's mentioned the same way in Jeremiah 51. But in Genesis 42, uh, 41, verse 32, we get an insight here fr from uh, uh, the, uh, 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 from actually Joseph. Because the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh. Joseph is interpreting the dream to Pharaoh. And he says that because the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. So linguistically, saying it's fallen, is fallen, is a form of emphasis that implies near-term timing. It's going to be very quickly done. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen very quickly. A third angel, we'll, we'll get into the whole Babylon thing more when we get to chapter 17, 18. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And it goes on. You know, this is one of the reasons that there's so much emphasis in our studies on the mark of the beast and, the, uh, and his image. Because if you take his mark, if you, if you pledge allegiance to him, then you forfeit any opportunity of being saved. That's a heavy, heavy thing to... to, to uh, it's, 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 the things are really getting down to the wire here. Things are really black and white. There's no gray here. Uh, if any man worship the beast, the, the, the succumbing leader that's afoot, and his image. There's again, we have this identity with his, uh, identity with his image, and apparently his sidekick, the false prophet, has the ability to make that image um, apparently be alive. And, he, and, and, and receive his mark. It's not your mark that's the issue, it's his mark. 
his number, and in his forehead or in his hand. And we suspect that that linkage, as we we covered some of this when we were in chapter 13, but basically it, 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 it it's my uh, suspicion that that uh, identity has to do with his head wound, the fact that he's one, his right eye and his right arm is withered and so forth. And that may be the way his followers uh, indicate their allegiance to him is by receiving his mark in those terms. But uh, it's, it's uh, and we're so used to um, a gospel of grace that there's always, we always feel that there's a, a, an opportunity to, to uh, you, you never deny the opportunity. There, here, clearly, uh, it's over. If, they've, if, if someone has taken that commitment, it's, it's over. And uh, um, the same thing's true with all of us, in a sense. Because the day will, God's grace isn't always open. You never know what a day may bring. We should have in our own hearts the same sense of urgency of making a clear, unqualified commitment to Christ because we don't know what tomorrow brings. And, uh, but these situations are, this is obviously a different period here. This, I believe, is what Jesus is talking about in, his, in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, where he says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever re receiveth the mark of his name. There it is again, the, the, the emphasis. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. This, this voice from the fourth angel is a strange um, assurance, if you will. From, in other words, from now on. See, this assurance is only relevant if they feel they have missed the resurrection. This is the kind of assurance that would make sense if the rapture has already taken place. What have they missed? Most people don't, wouldn't use this as a proof text or something, but this is another indication that this only makes sense if, there, if there's some reason they have missed the rapture. This is exactly the kind of uh, situation that Paul was trying to address in the first letter to Thessalonians. Because they had some of their friends die, and they felt that because they died, that they would miss out somehow. And Paul was pointing out that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain uh, will be caught up with him. And in, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. But it, this is a similar kind of commitment that implies it's only relevant to people who would have some reason to doubt that. And I think that's in it. Here's the patient of the saints that here, uh, they have to keep the commandments and so forth. And uh, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord henceforth. Even so, even though a rapture's taken place, they're still in, in, uh, in good shape. And so you, to, to really understand that, you should uh, explore Paul's disclosures in 1 Thessalonians 4 and following. And I looked and behold a white cloud. Boy, we could talk about white clouds. Um, again and again, who is, who, who is on the white cloud? Jesus. It's amazing how many commentators have doubts about the identity of the person in verse 14. And, uh, but uh, here's, behold, on a white cloud, upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. In other words, it's not only is he on a white cloud, this is not an angel, this is someone who's human. The word Son, that's why Luke always uses that term for the Messiah, the Son of Man, to emphasize his humanity. Here is someone with humanity that's on the white cloud, having on his head a golden crown. There you are again. And in his hand, ah, a sharp sickle. This is new. This is something different. The sickle occurs 12 times in the scriptures, um, seven times in this section alone, and four times uh, in this chapter. We're going to hear sickle, sickle, sickle here in a minute. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The word ripe there is misunderstood. You and I think of fruit when it's ripe is the time to eat it. The Greek term here implies um, that it's really withered. It's overripe. The time is late. It's not, you're, you're not, you're not 
trying to harvest in the sense of capturing it for its goodness, you're harvesting because it's it's overripe. And that's what that's really what's uh, hidden in in the in the uh, semantics here. Um, for the time has come. In other words, it's high time. It's time to do this. And so this is the big green light to go for it. Now you have the cloud. <laughs> this might be a good time just to review a little bit. What is this cloud? The Shekinah, as we sometimes call it. We fo it followed them in the wilderness, of course, in Exodus. It was also prominent with the falling of the manna in Exodus 16. The giving of the law twice, the first and second time, it was present. It filled the tabernacle, as you may recall. It also was always hovering over the mercy seat. It was there when the 70 elders were chosen in Numbers 11. And it filled the temple so much the priests couldn't even officiate. Solomon's temple when that time came, so forth. And it finally departs from Israel very dramatically in, uh, in the writings of Ezekiel. And uh, so... In the New Testament, of course, it was the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah, that overshadows Mary. It's the Shekinah that was present when the flocks of the shepherds, obviously very much so at the transfiguration, and at the ascension, and at the rapture, and at his return. So the Shekinah becomes synonymous, in our minds at least, with the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation, if you will, of the Spirit of God, a member of the, of the, of the Trinity. So he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This is not a wheat harvest, this is a grape harvest. And the, the, the idioms here are very different. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Strange terminology here. We're not talking about uh, a wheat harvest. We're talking about a grape harvest. And it's also very graphic because you can visualize what they call the wine fat, which in this case will be blood, the blood of the nations. And... Uh, uh, Jeremiah talks about this back in Je Jeremiah 25. Therefore prophesy thou against all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his, um, uh, upon his ha habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. And he goes on. And so... The winepress was trodden without the city, that is outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles. So we're talking what, four feet deep? By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. What on earth is this hinting at, or alluding to, or what, what's the picture here? Well, we're going to encounter, I think as you know, the Battle of Armageddon. Where's Megiddo? Battle of Armageddon is that it, it's Har Megiddo, Har means Mount, Mount Megiddo overlooks the Valley of Jezreel. It's just a little southeast of Haifa. When we visit there, we always visit there, you can overlook this incredible valley that, uh, is, that we'll talk about uh, in, the, in the study more later. But we also know that the, Jesus told his believers when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies to flee into the mountains. That's all in Luke 21, and, and, and uh, because back, there's actually two, in the Olive Discourse, deals with two destructions of Jerusalem. Luke focuses on the first one, and because they followed his instructions, they, uh, well, let me back up a minute, get, review this, because I don't want to mess this up. Nero had told General Vespasian, and his son Titus, who's also a military leader, to attacked Jerusalem. So they had, in preparation of that, they had attacked the cities in northern Galilee. They were getting ready to attack Jerusalem when Nero dies. And there's a struggle in Rome for power. And three contenders were trying to get power till finally Vespasian himself was fed up with what's going on. He went to Rome and he took over the Roman Empire, becomes the emperor. And he instructs Titus, his son, then to finish the job. But there's a hiatus while all this is going on for almost a year. And so during that hiatus, those that had been briefed by Jesus, that Luke records, got out of there. 
and went to Pella in, in Perea. And uh, Eusebius in the early church fathers uh, records that none of the Christians, there were over a million, uh, some say a million and a half, men, women, and children that perished in the, in the siege under Titus Vespasian. It was the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But the, the, uh, the uh, Christians, the believers in Christ, got out of there because Jesus had warned them to, that Luke emphasizes. In fact, he, Luke makes the, uh, uh, he records the remark that this generation would not pass away until all be fulfilled. Well, 38 years after Jesus said that, all this occurs. So we got that. It's interesting. That's the same period of time that the Israel wandered, that generation that wandered in the wilderness back in Numbers. So, but the the uh, the presentation that Mark that uh, Mark and uh, Matthew make of Jesus' presentation, they're not the same times. Most people assume that the Olivet Discourse, as recorded in Matthew 24, Luke 13, and and uh, Luke 21, is the same presentation. It's very similar. But Luke's presentation is, re if you'll notice, verse 7, 37, 38, there is in the temple, not on Mount of Olives. The one that Matthew and Mark record was a private briefing given to the inside group, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And Matthew ex expresses, focuses on that which is going to happen after a group of signs that both of them deal with. Luke focuses on what's going to happen before those signs, and that's what we talked about. Matthew talks about after these signs comes the, the, the uh, abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, and so forth. Be Matthew is really addressed, his, his presentation, Christ's presentation as recorded by Matthew, is addressing the Jews in Jerusalem at this time. And, uh, uh, and once the abomination of desolation takes place, which of course not, none of that took place in AD 70, obviously, those after the abomination of the desolation, they are to flee to the mountains. This is, so they're going to flee to Petra, Basra in the old name, Petra in the new name. And that's, we're going to cover all that. That's all in Isaiah 63 and so forth. We'll get into that. In Isaiah 63, we have a description of the return of Jesus Christ. It may surprise many people because they all think he's going to first come to the Mount of Olives because of Zechariah 14. No, he's got an errand before then. He comes to Basra to rescue the remnant that fled there. So he's, so they, they, they acknowledge him as, uh, as Messiah. They petition his return. And Isaiah records this. He says, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, I that speak in righteousness and mighty to save. That's a tight, especially in the Hebrew. That's, that's messianic. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? In other words, this dignitary that's, there, that's coming to Basra is covered, or coming from Basra, is covered with blood. Not the blood he shed, it's the blood of his enemies, we'll find out. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. You know, that's kind of interesting to understand. Several places in Scripture you'll discover that we always think of him coming back with his armies, the believers, the church, uh, the, the angels. They indeed may be coming with them. They're not necessary. He handles this himself. Jesus does not need our help, okay? There was, there, there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger. I will trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart. And the year of my redeemed is come. And it goes on in Isaiah 63. You may recall when Jesus opened his ministry in the synagogue of Nazareth, back in Luke 4, he reads from the book of Isaiah his mandate for his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord has call, called upon me, and he goes through what we would call Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, to, to heal the broken hearts and to heal the sick. And it goes right through all the things that he was to do, but he stops in a strange place. And, 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 and he, he stops at a place and then closes the book, and then sits there and says, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And before the episode's over, they want to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. But the point is, you, you go back to, uh, to Isaiah to read what he was reading from, and you notice something very strange. He stopped at a comma. And the phrase that he did not include says, 
and the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped before the comma because that was his mandate for the first coming. His second coming is the day of vengeance. And that's what we're dealing with here. If we we're going to write a book on this, we could validly call it the day of vengeance. Because that's what we're really dealing with here. Most people have probably no capacity to recognize what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back. This isn't this uh, soft-spoken carpenter son petting children on the head, walking along the Sea of Galilee, uh, you know, saying beautiful things. He's coming back as a warrior, and he is coming back in God's fury. I will trample them in my fury. We have probably no capacity to imagine what that really is going to mean, but the next few chapters are going to try to get that across. And their blood shall be sprinkled in my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the day of my redeemed is come. I looked, and there was none to help. And I wonder that there was none to uphold. This is the observer saying, Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me, and I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drink in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth, and so on. So understand, that's going down in a, in a region that would be characterized by Petra. If you look from Megiddo, which is up near Haifa, from Megiddo to Petra is, guess, how long? 1,600 furlong, furlongs. I, I, I checked that this afternoon just to be sure I was on sound ground here. I've read that several places. I had checked it myself. Yeah, we're talking about 176 miles. Furlong is about 600 feet. For those of you who don't play the horses, you may not know. Okay. All right. Okay. So we've gone through a table of contents, if you will, of what's coming. The Lamb on Zion, 144,000, and seven angels. And uh, the last three dealing with the call for the grape harvest. A couple of thoughts I want to get across here. Those who think that the church is going through the tribulation um, understand neither the nature of the church nor the nature of the tribulation. The great tribulation is the pouring out of God's wrath. Anyone who thinks the church go, and, and, and the and the uh, goes through the tribulation needs to study ecclesiology as well as prophecy because they're two different issues. And uh, they, anyone that feels that way underestimates both. They underestimate what the church is and they underestimate what the tribulation is really all about. And uh, and uh, now before that morning dawns, the long night of the human race is going to grow a lot darker and uh, much darker. And this cha chapter here, chapter 14, is just a preamble to chapter 15 and 16. And uh, let's go to get into this much more detail. We get chapter 15 is going to open up, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. You and I have no ability to imagine what the wrath of God is like. We tend to focus on man as a creator, as a source of grace and abundance and uh, provision and so forth. And that's all great. But I don't think we have any ability to imagine the wrath of God. And that's what's going to be unleashed in these seven last plagues. And that's uh, that, that set the stage for Jesus coming back and setting up God's kingdom. Now we've gone through the uh, last of these parenthetical passages, chapter 14, ending the parenthetical. We're going to, when we get to chapter 15 following, we're going to have the seventh trumpet in effect, which will open up s seven censers or bowls or vials, whatever. And... Uh, that's going to be the subject next time. But this leads to a whole issue that will lurk in our thinking. I want to just touch on in anticipation of the next session. And that's probably the most uncomfortable doctrine in the Christian uh, area. Uh, the rapture is probably the most preposterous thing for many. But the one that's certainly the most difficult for us to somehow embrace is this whole idea of endless punishment. We have probably an inability to do that. Salvation supposes uh, a prior damnation. And most of us have no ability to really get into it. In order to escape danger, you first of all have to believe in it. And there's no error more fatal to us than the doctrine of universalism. That's what we would 
the doctor of universalism is uh, it blots out the attribute of retributive justice. We can't we can't imagine that. It transmutes sin into simply misfortune. It turns all suffering into chastisement. It relegates the sacrifice of Christ to simply moral influence. No, no, it's much more than that. It makes the sacrifice of Christ a debt due to man instead of an unmerited boon from God, which it really is. We probably have an inability to really embrace this, not only because we can't understand the darkness of our own sin. There's another part of this problem. We probably have no capacity to imagine what it means to speak of a holy God. It isn't that, from, from our perspective, it isn't just that we're so bad, it's that we are so far below where He is. There, that, that gap is, to us, unimaginable. Because we are members of a fallen race. And that's exactly what the Bible is there to try to communicate to us and to try to express the extremes God has gone to to rescue us from our predicament. But you can't rescue us from a predicament if we don't understand that we're in a predicament. See, throughout the Bible, from Genesis 1 on, we see God's love and grace, and it's always available to all who will accept it. And it's the rejection of that that creates the problems. The entire Bible is a record of the extremes that God has gone to in order to allow us to avoid the destiny of our fallen state. What's our response to that? No, God, I don't want to love you. That's what a lot of the response is. I want to run things my way. I want it, as, as the song says, I'll do it my way. Good luck. <laughs> God has three alternatives faced with us. His first alternative is, is to indulge it and allow it to go on forever. But in that case, the cruelty, the injustice, the hatred, the pain, and the death that now prevails to the earth will go on forever too. And God doesn't want that, and neither do we. So there's a second alternative. God can force man into being an automata and uh, control the human race as if we're just some kind of assembly, like, like a robot or something. But remo removing our free will also will take away our capacity to love Him back, to love Him freely. Love cannot be forced. So that leads to the only remaining alternative. If we fail to respond to him, he can he can't he can he can't indulge it, obviously. He can't force us. What can he do? His only uh, only remaining alternative is to withdraw himself. Now you and I have no ability to imagine what that can really mean. Um if he, if, first of all, if he withdraws himself, that will leave us to our own means forever. And uh, since part of the part of the thing to try to get across here is God, the existence of God is necessary for our continued existence. You know, it's interesting. Let's just start go back and talk about a fertilized egg. The sperm fertilizes an egg. You have a zygote, and that single cell then mitosis into what? Two cells. You look through a microscope, you see the two become four, the four become eight, the eight becomes, and you see this thing grow. But then pretty soon, you'll notice that these cells are dividing, not identically. You'll notice, the up, while they're identical, that makes sense, okay, they split identically, 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 but then pretty soon you notice there's a dark line that starts to show up, that later becomes a backbone. And you suddenly discover that some of these cells are becoming bone tissue, muscle tissue, cortical tissue and so forth. And these different tissues then become organs. And as, as this thing grows into an embryo and ultimately a human being or whatever, um, you see the special, specialization occur. If you study that from an information science point of view, you're struck with a very, very strange insight that would be very familiar to anyone that's been in the computer industry. And let me give you an example. Suppose every one of you in the audience could play skillfully any musical instrument. And let's assume there's plenty of musical instruments around. And let's assume I gave each one of you a complete copy of a, of a symphony. Would we have a symphony? Each one of you, all the, each one of you have all that you need, have all the skills you need, because and you have, a, you have all the information needed individually. Would you have a symphony? And the answer is, of course not. First of all, you need a conductor. 
We would call that in the computer industry, you need some what's called conflict resolution logic. Somebody has to decide, you're going to be first violin, you're going to be percussion, you're going to whatever, whatever they are and so forth, okay? When you start analyzing this, you suddenly realize that this process we watch of the cell becoming a human being requires something from the outside. It can't happen on its own. From an information point of view, you have to have an external input, design input. And uh, it isn't enough of just having all the design information within the cell. You need to have, um, uh, it turns out anyway, uh, the experts have uh, convinced me that God has to be involved in every cell division. We can't imagine See, we know today, just from physics, that every photon, every electron, is connected to every other electron. That what we're in is a digital simulation. Even this last Scientific American article indicates that just our physics constants indicate that we're a shadow of a larger reality. So what I guess I'm saying is, we can't imagine the creation of life without God being involved, but more than just an initiator. Uh, this is what I think Colossians mean when it says that he, it, all things are made by him, and by him are all things, cons, all con, things consist, as the King James, all things held together. We can't imagine what it's like, what it would be like, if God stepped back and left us alone. We, and I, I, I personally suspect all these other idioms, the fire and hell and all these things are derivative of uh, our, our, our uh, simemes or semantics to try to get across to us. Uh, what we're facing if God does is forced by us to withdraw himself from us. And that's what we're dealing with here. There are really two deaths. Physical death, of course, is separation of the soul from the body. Most of us can grasp that. But we also know from the scripture there's a thing called spiritual death, the second death, if you will. And it's the separation of the soul from the spirit of God himself. And I don't think we can handle that when it, if and when it finally happens. So ultimately, it's we ourselves who choose whether God will judge us. It's our choice. It is we ourselves who decide either to accept or to refuse His grace, love, and forgiveness. It's up to us. It is we ourselves who choose everlasting life or everlasting death. And we have no ability to imagine what the everlasting death really involves. Because the real you... See, part of the problem is I, as I look at you, I can't really see you. I can see the temporary residence that you're, re you're in. And uh, I've used this before, but I'll, I'll just allude to it again. I, I forgot to bring, I was going to bring a little diskette. You know, if, uh, you, all of you, everybody's exposed to a computer, I assume. If I held up a little three-inch diskette, you all would know what I'm talking about, right? If I had a blank cassette and put it on a postal scale, it would weigh about seven-tenths of an ounce. If I load if spent hem several hundred dollars and load it with over a, a million bytes of software, and put it on a postal scale, what it will it weigh? Seven tenths of an ounce. Software has no mass. It's like a light switch, it's on or off. It doesn't weigh any difference whether it's on or off. See, it's, software is information, not substance in that sense. And I can even send software through the airwaves, can I? Software has no mass. The, the real you is software, not hardware. That means the real you has no mass. Some of us have a little too much mass in terms of the residence we're in. But the real you has no mass, which means it has no time dimension. Time is a physical property. That's why that insight is so important. So you're eternal whether you like it or not. You're eternal whether you're saved or not. The question is where are you going to spend it? Are you going to spend it in the presence of God, or will he, you're forcing Him to withdraw Himself? Because there's a time. By the way, you know there's one thing that we're all going to do on time. You know what that is? Die. All, I'm, I know I'm going to die on... That's probably the only thing I'll ever do on time. I'll die on time. God knows when, and it'll be the right time, and so forth. And uh, that's probably true of all of us. Anyway, the next session, read chapters 15 and 16, in which we're going to encounter the seven bowls of God's wrath. And while you're at doing all that, make sure of your own personal destiny. You should not, at this point, have any doubt whatsoever as to what would, where you would be if something should happen to you tonight, tomorrow, what have you. So with that, see you in the next session.